Day 602 of the Ukrainian War Map, also known as the Russo-Ukrainian War. Juzzy here, and today is another update as I take a simplified and down-to-earth approach to some of the most important happenings on the ground in Ukraine. So starting off, we'll take a look at those Russian losses as currently Russia sits on more than 290 thousand military personnel losses now which represents an additional 620 in the past day then as for hardware losses two tanks 15 apvs eight artillery and a whole flurry of aircraft and that's largely the point for today's video really as i was uh having to move around some commitments so i could do this video today for you and so we'll move across to the map now as in follow-up to early yesterday's a uh, Ukrainian strike on Russian-occupied Berdyansk in Zaporizhia, right there. Certainly a lot more incredible information has come to light since then. So what actually happened turned out to be a Ukrainian special forces operation codenamed Dragonfly that ended up seeing Ukraine use the newly delivered Atakams surface-to-air missiles successfully attacking Berdyansk and Luhansk airfields. Now, as a result, the enemy's losses are said to be, for instance, nine helicopters, uh, an air defense launcher, special vehicles, and ammo depots as well. All in what is considered to be one of the worst blows to the Russian military aviation sector throughout this entire year, and in fact, probably beyond. Now, as for Berdyansk in particular, there was a large fleet of Ka-52s, Mi-8s, as well as several Mi-28s and 24s on the airfield. But also a nearby aviation arms depot was hit just there as well. And the fact that something like this could happen is quite interesting considering Russia has multiple air defenses located nearby to protect the fleet, uh, including things such as Panseers, Book M3s, as well as something called the Tekek type radar system. And do note, the Pantsia air defense system was destroyed and the rest did not help. Now, as for the Attackham's weapons specifics, there appears to be some confusion over this. But the actual Attackham's missiles used very much appear to be the MGM 140A variants, as literally shown from the follow up photographs from Russian personnel which therefore makes for a range of 165 kilometers or about 103 miles. And if we are to go to the map and have a look at uh, the, the distance exactly from the front line, and if I can get this to work, and so roughly, roughly 110 kilometers out of a total 165 kilometers that it can go. So something that your more conventional HIMARS missile, such as the Gimlars missile, could not reach. And in fact, range like this is more than enough to reach, well, almost everywhere in Russian-occupied Ukraine, except for a few Crimean edge cases. But Ukraine may indeed have the 300km Attackums variant, which we, we just don't know about yet. As this was a surprise attack, nobody was expecting to see this happen just yesterday. Although so far it's been communicated that Ukraine received less than a dozen from the US and they may have used up to five in these strikes yesterday morning at about 4 a.m. I would also note this missile can be launched from the M142 HIMARS platform and also the, uh, the M270B Mars 2, you know, the tracked wheel variants, somewhat similar to the HIMARS. Now, some might ask, why Attackums? Why not Storm Shadows? They already have this kind of range, don't they? Well, it's to do with the Attackums cluster submunitions, capable of attacking open soft targets within an area as their primary mission. Whereas Storm Shadows, on the other hand, have a singular unitary warhead. So hypothetically, one Storm Shadow could equate to one helicopter hit, whereas one Attackums could equate to many, many hit, as its submunitions shrapnel effective, effectively is, is everywhere over the airfield instead. Interestingly, we even saw the age, the actual production manufacture year and month of these Attackums missiles from the photos, with one showing a manufacturer date of 1996 and another with 1997. So certainly a very cost-effective use of old inventory. 
But more than that, when you think about it, it's embarrassing for Russia that their quote-unquote world-class air defense systems have been bested by a 27-year-old missile. So it's not a good day for Russian propaganda. And so the implication for a new capability like this of Ukraine's goes far beyond, beyond my previous mention of uh, Ukraine's ground coverage they've got with these types of missiles. Because this means Russia have to push back their, their aircraft fleets back even further from their existing positions. Thus, the longer it takes for Russian air support to respond and carry out strikes, then combine that with the waning of Russian artillery shelling, all which will cause a very heavy blow to the only real advantages they have. Also note, as where Berdyansk is concerned, uh, the airfield is, or was, the, the main airfield for the Russian forces as uh, they used it to launch attacks on the frontline units in Zaporizhia. So it's just truly devastating in the way that it takes out another limb of Russia's offensive capabilities. Which means, in some instances, this means that uh, it will result in Russian helicopters having to potentially journey 300 plus kilometers to the front lines in the futures. And in the very least, have them significantly spread out. So this will result in far less helicopter attacks on Ukrainian units, thereby aiding Ukraine's offensive operations on the ground. Takums have profoundly changed the dynamics with nowhere left to hide. And it seems Ukraine is now warning every enemy soldier and collaborator currently in Crimea to get out now, as this may be their last chance. Now, when I popped up my video from yesterday, I briefly reported on this location of Berdyansk. I didn't mention it uh, over the audio, but I did place an image uh, on the screen showing photos taken by the Russian military showing an M74 submunition, which is used in Attackums. Then I popped up a little Attackums uh, word with a question mark on the screen, but I was, I was actually half joking at the time. But you know what? This is classic Ukraine, with their first use of many inbound NATO platforms that they receive that are typically first deployed with an element of surprise. For instance, just off the top of my head, there was the UK Supercats taking out helicopter after helicopter, KA-52 after KA-52. Good work there. Uh, also the, the Storm and Scout missiles, of course, particularly the Storms certain long-range uh, drones as well. And not to mention those cute little Australian cardboard drones too. Now, naturally, Ukrainian President Zelensky confirmed the use of the attackums, which was somewhat expected right after an attack of this magnitude. And so here's a photo, uh, an older photo from about three days ago now, the, the 15th of October, where it looks like a minimum of 20 helicopters were stationed uh, at this location in Berdyansk, possibly 22 by my count. And at this location, they just cannot go any further back unless they fall into the, the Sea of Azov. Which reminds me of how I really wanted to get into the, the Russian response to this, which was not a happy one. As a Russian Air Force adjacent telegram channel stated out that it was just not a good mo morning and that Russia had experienced one of the most significant blows to date. And my favorite part, specifying, quote, it's pointless to write about the facts that need to draw conclusions so that this doesn't happen again. This will happen again as long as the war continues. We must be more prepared for this, end quote. But of course, much easier is said than done for Russia. And goodness, what a blow to morale as well. And we say that all the time, but let's just say you feel for the Ukrainian air fleet and it happened to them instead. It would not be a good feeling. So in the end, more and more information is coming out. We may never know the full extent of what's happened, but then again, information does always seem to wiggle its way out from the Russian side. So I do look forward to, we all look forward to hearing more about this story shortly again. And I'll move across to the map very briefly today. There's a couple of interesting things I'd like to mention. So uh, start out quickly in Avdivka. So elements from within the, uh, the Russian side admit that their attacks on Avdivka has been one of their costliest yet in this war. 
but I should put in brackets there, not from an aircraft standpoint, that just happened in Berdyansk. Then they go on to say that it's just been a, a failure and that now they're being uh, barraged with Ukrainian shells with nowhere to go. They state that they're out of artillery and also that Ukrainian artillerists just continue to pound with shelling operations of their own. So it's not looking great there for the Russian forces. Then moving across on the map, something that I really wanted to quickly add in there today, Kherson, in fact, would you believe it? Some potential changes here. So uh, I'll give you maybe a different map for this one, but the, uh, so some Russian personnel are commenting that the AFU are making a push, stating that, quote, Russians are looking at a strategic disaster at a scale that has not been seen since Baliklia, which is in Kharkiv, end quote there. Now, if this map, which is a Russian produced map, is accurate, this has a lot of potential because if Pishchenivka or Poima are liberated by, say, next morning, the Russians are looking at a strategic disaster at a scale that has not yet been seen, like I said, since Balaklia or Kharkiv. With really giving the Ukrainian forces an inroad into the, the southern Dnipro. Then we'll head across to some quick news for today. So the US military has stated that all 31 Abrams tanks have been signed, sealed, and delivered to Ukraine now. Previously, it was stated that only 10 or so had arrived a couple of weeks ago or so. But uh, that has now been updated to the full 31 as pledged there. Also, all the, the, the trained tank crews are in Ukraine now and maintenance and tank spare parts, munitions and log logistics platforms are all there now as well. Then in some other quick hardware news, so good news from France. So last January, France was sending Ukraine 1,155mm NATO standard size artillery shells a month to Ukraine. But this coming January, it will rise to 3,000 a month. Now, on a larger scale, it's not much, but every European country and every other country really doing their part really is what is causing and is helping to increase daily artillery fire rates from the Ukrainian forces. We'll try to find that graphic and uh, throw it up again for you guys there. Also, still within France, so the self-propelled howitzers, the Caesars of France, their production will also rise to eight a month from two a month, which was the case back in the, the start of 2022. So that's, that's pretty incredible to see. Also in France, the Thales radar production has doubled as well. And like I say, it's just one of many examples throughout Europe and, and the greater globe that are doing this right now. And there's a lot of uh, expansionist forces out there in, in the world. So deterrence like uh, production, like what I've just mentioned, is always quite important. Then in some other news, the Russian Volunteer Corps, which is the Russian Freedom Fighting Group that is aligned with Ukraine, stationed in Ukraine's north, and sometimes over the border in Russia's Belgorod Oblast as well, have stated that some former Wagner PMC mercenaries and Storm Z personnel have actually joined the ranks of the Russian Volunteer Corps to effectively take back their Russia. And events like these are not surprising in some ways, considering the outcome of former Wagner PMC boss Prigozhin, who most sides agree or deeply suspect that Putin put a hit out on Prigozhin there which really hit a nerve with a large portion of the Wagner PMC. Putin made a poor choice with doing that, allegedly. Uh, Putin would have been better off to have uh, made it so that no one ever heard from Prigozhin again. Instead of eliminating Prigozhin, pretty much in broad daylight. Now, as for the recruitment side of things, back to that part of the story, this was all by the, the Russian volunteer corps, uh, Denis Nikitin, a leader of the RDC. That's the Russian volunteer corps. And he considered that the recruitment to have been an experiment, but uh, had, had, in fact, he said, met with wild success. So, interesting times. And that will be it for today, guys. No funny for today. Wasn't even expecting to do a video, <laughs> but uh, I did flood this video with plenty of memes that I'm sure you enjoyed anyway. 
So thanks again. I'll see you in the next one. Please uh, like, comment, subscribe if not already. Uh, check out the, the links below. And I, I do hope to see all of you guys there in the next one. Cheers.